So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the arms direction, specifically in HPC, but what's driving us there. I have to prefix this a little bit by the fact that I've only been at ARM six or eight months now. I have a history of HPC that I'll talk about here, as well as a history of, of startups. I'm super excited by what's going on in hardware, in high performance computing, and especially with what's going on at ARM. So I hope to convince you that there's some real opportunity here. I'm going to talk a little bit around this fancy image I got from the marketing department. I really have a technical background, so uh, I apologize for the marketing slides. At ARM, we believe in the next 10 or 15 years, there's going to be a trillion edge devices out in the world. And each of them is going to be wanting to communicate. The magic promise of 5G networking is going to permit some of that communications to come back to the edge or the fog computing that you've probably heard of. And the critical data is going to come back to the data center. I care a whole lot about the high performance computing aspect of this, which often gets just lumped in with the cloud and the data center. But keep this image in mind as we go through here. Folks here are probably a lot more familiar with ARM than I was. I've got an HPC background again. So for me, ARM was the gizmo that was in my cell phone. ARM actually started with Apple, which was an interesting uh, lineage for me. John's in the back smiling. He's probably been there for the whole, the whole part of it. ARM today is to edge computing what Intel is to server computing. That's the way I look at it. ARM has the dominant share of IoT embedded that space. So it's a force to be reckoned with on the very uh, power constrained performance challenge end of the spectrum. Everything from your cell phone to your car, that sort of thing. I'm here to help ARM move leftwards on that first image into the data center. And again, uh, I think it's an interesting time to be here. So a little bit about my background. I grew up in Canada in a climate quite similar to what you see outside and have evolved might be the appropriate word. I now live in California, Southern California, where I can drive to the beach in 20 minutes and I can see snow 50 miles off. That's exactly how I had intended this to work. I attended a seminar kind of similar to this when I was an undergraduate in school and a guy named Dan Wilson stood up there and said, Computers today are really fast. They're 20 megahertz. We got this Motorola 68000. Some of you should be smiling by now, right? You're my age. 20 megahertz. This thing runs great. What would happen if we did two of them, four of them, eight of them, 16 of them? And he convinced the crowd that this Canadian company could build what, what they called the Mirius 4000, which was 4096 discrete CPUs in one box. This was in the mid 80s, and I was I'm a sucker for a really good talk, so I was in it. Jumped in and uh, helped out with that company. From there, believe it or not, I talked my way into a US weapons lab and went to work at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and have spent several hundred million dollars on high performance computing since then. So as a customer of high performance computing with the Crays and the IBMs and so on, I have been on the teams that have built the number one system several times over the past 30 years or so. Um, I initially started in a project called the uh, Massively Parallel Computing Initiative, where those of you as old as I have heard the phrase, the killer micro, which was to put the, the vector dinosaur machines out of business and usher in the era of parallel computing. As part of that, I wrote a piece of software that did time sharing on the systems that those of you who are sysadmins now know as Slurm. I won't take credit for the current version, but I did write the initial version of that. And I also wrote several compilers along the way. The Parallel C preprocessor was one that, that now people talk about as UPC in uh, HPC uh, frames there. So I've got quite a bit of history with the startup of, of all this. I went and did a few, uh, since, since I was in Silicon Valley, I left Livermore and went and did some startup companies when the internet was just becoming commercialized and, and found that to be a lot of fun. 
So I, I will try to claim at least a little bit of a unique career doing high performance computing and doing startups. And they do come back together in the company that I sold to Intel. So in the 2000s, color was invented. And all of a sudden, we get to use nice, pretty graphs. I went back to Livermore. I got citizenship. I got a top secret clearance. And I worked on the, the weapons program much more directly and ran the IBM Blue Gene architecture, which was an architecture that may be recent enough that some of you are familiar with. That's where we took clusters from 10,000 cores to 200,000 cores. And the latest machine was about a six million, four and a half million cores and six million threads or something like that. So we took the scale and made it huge. Note the, the processors we worked with were the, the power four, I believe, 15 watt processors mass produced. Um, if you fast forward that to the announcement this week, Fujitsu announced an ARM-based system, the post-K machine at Ricken, that has 7.5 million cores, ARM cores in it, each with vector instructions and 150,000 sockets. And that will be a single system image system um, coming up here in the next year or two. Uh, I am a firm believer in students and education. And one of the things that I did kind of as a side project was an event called the Student Cluster Competition. And it's now, it's, it's grown way beyond my dreams, but it's now an event that's held at ISC. And I think it's held, it's actually held next week in China. We started it in 07 in uh, Reno for SC07. And the intent at the time, clusters were, were becoming uh, real. They were becoming systems that were going to go on the top 500. At Livermore, we had a 19 teraflop cluster with IBM, or with Intel, sorry, that was uh, Mellanox Interconnect, if I remember. And the old guard of HPC was busy looking down their noses at at doing this form of computing. And one thing that I like to do is change up the status quo and see if I can't stir the pot a bit and do something different. So I went to the, the SC committee and said, I think that we need to teach people a lesson. You can go to your local college and get six undergraduates and they can stand up a supercomputer in real time on the show floor and run the same applications that our scientists run. With any good idea, it takes a couple years to ram it down people's throats. But I was persistent, and I got that through. And I think we just passed our 10th or 11th year on the event. It's held worldwide. It impacts thousands of undergraduates every year. There's at least tens, if not hundreds, of careers launched out of this. So I really latch on to this as something that I'm proud of being involved in. <clears throat> Another thing that I did that, that wasn't that isn't necessarily up here, but I was in Edinburgh in 91 for CUG. I think it was CUG. And met a guy by the name of Greg Wilson who got his PhD out of Edinburgh. And he and I started up an event called Software Carpentry. And that was to teach scientists, people who don't have to put science in their you know, computing science, people who are physicists and teach them how to use these big parallel machines. These things literally cost $100 million and you're putting something on it that barely knows how to type at a command line. And so we built up a lot of infrastructure around how to take a scientist and teach him about data management, teach him about version control, teach him about the sorts of things that you would need to do to make efficient use of these systems. Greg continued on with that project. I let him, I, I went off and went back to Livermore in, in 2000 or so. That project now, Software Carpentry, which is softwarecarpentry.org, I think, has a class at least once a day, 365 days a year. It's spun off data carpentry. So it, it's done a lot of good as well. The thing that most people on HPC think of me as, though, is the luster guy. When Sun was sold to Oracle, Oracle stood up and the message that was received by the community is you're no longer going to get Lustre. We're going to put it up on a shelf. And again, I'm a sucker for somebody giving me a suggestion. The guy next to me leaned over and said, somebody ought to do something about this. So I went and, uh, and raised venture capital and launched a company called WAMCloud. 
and forked the Lustre code from the GPL to keep it relevant to the high performance computing community. That was in 2010 and ended up selling that company to Intel. I spent five years at Intel as a GM for HPC data type topics. So I, I tell you all this to try to convince you that I've got both a, a mindset for startups and doing things differently as well as a bit of a history in high performance computing. This is by far my favorite register um, quote, by the way. I use that one a lot with the venture capitalists. Those guys are great at that. So I'm gonna shift gears now and talk about the fifth wave of computing and what we see as the change. Up until now, this is the architecture of the internet. You've got centralized compute, massive amounts of bandwidth downstream to edge devices, your phone, your PC, whatever. The simplified version of this is there are a bunch of cat videos on the left and you want to see them on the right on your phone. And so there's a huge amount of infrastructure built up to be able to handle that. There's also a number of companies that have been very successful. Akamai is one that comes to mind. Their market cap is $12 billion and they really, they do CDN, right? They do content distribution networks. They do a caching layer and they've managed to build up a $12 billion company. I don't know if anybody in here is motivated by money at all, but I think there's some big opportunities coming up with this change of, of architecture. So as we move forward to the future with a trillion devices, imagine a scenario where you've got a billion video devices on the edge, say a billion phones, and there's a billion iPhones in existence today. So if you just took the iPhone population and said everybody's running their iPhone, that would create 400 exabytes of data aimed back towards the cloud. Right now those cat videos take up 150 exabytes of bandwidth coming down to your phone and we're all architected for outbound communications. So what we're saying is a very small subset of cheap $10 devices can completely obliterate the upstream traffic and provide you with 400 exabytes, way more than you could ever handle on the current structure. It would also take 400 million servers to be able to process all that data. And that's more than all of the cloud providers have today. So something's broken. And we are here to argue that it's a great opportunity to re-architect how the internet's going to happen. So back to our, um, our nice picture here. We believe that this is the way that the internet's going to work in the future. You're going to have a, a trillion devices out here. Each of those devices need to have some level of intelligence. Opportunity here is for research into how to make those devices intelligent enough so that they don't continually send data to the left in this picture. One of the tenements of HPC back in the early 90s was rule of thumb is you build the biggest, baddest, fastest network you can and then you spend all your time figuring out how not to use it. Okay, the same thing applies here. We're gonna put as much infrastructure as we can in there but try real hard not to use it because it'll be trivial to overwhelm it. In the edge or the fog, we anticipate there'll be, I wanna say server class systems, server class systems by today's definition in the towers, in the 5G networks, that sort of thing. They'll obviously have a bit more capability and the opportunity there is to the balance, the processing of the data versus what you send upstream again and try to keep all of that data local and downstream of you. I tend to attract startups. Um, living in Silicon Valley and hanging out with the startup community, I get a lot of ideas run by my desk. And the number one idea that I see, or the number one request I see right now is, is there a way to do parallel processing out here at the edge in a fault tolerant manner and harness the collective power of those devices to do some of this work? I think that will be a key breakthrough that gets you a billion dollar company if, if that's what you're after. And then of course the critical data will come all the way back to the cloud data center or high performance computing. In terms of uh, what we expect to be going on here, 
right? It's local decisions at the edge, it's filter, it's quick react in the cloud in the center, analyze and store in the data centers, and then the, the deep training and prediction activity going on there. Huge amounts of opportunities for, uh, for impact here, all the way down the stack. In ARM, as I said, we are, let's see if I've got this, okay. ARM's business model, as I said, was the right-hand side of this. That's the ARM Cortex brand. Last fall, we came up with Neoverse as a brand, and the simplified way to think of that is it's everything to the left of the edge, okay? ARM is making a very strong push into data center, and the Neoverse is the IP brand that we use there. I'll show you some licenses as we go forward. So ARM Neoverse is, is the infrastructure brand that I, that I work with. And this is it in a, in a marketing slide. High performance computing, secure IP and architectures you can read. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna segue a little bit into why I think HPC is important. When I started in HPC, it was right around the time of the Cray 1, the Cray 2. This is a Cray 1 that I've worked on. Um, that first machine cost about $10 million to build. It was sold to Los Alamos at a price of about $10 million. So Seymour broke even on his very first machine. And then, of course, he shipped a whole bunch of these. HPC at that time in the 80s, transitioning into the 90s really set the pace for technology because the budgets were so small, the national laboratories could throw a few million dollars around and have a pretty strong impact on high performance computing. As part of our attack of the killer micros, we, we kind of shifted attention to let's take advantage of the commodity computing space. Outgrowth of that was the Beowulf cluster and the parallel computing that we see Today, only the, only the interconnect really survived there. The rest of the system was standard server class architecture. InfiniBand is kind of the, the only real survivor out of that now, plus the, the uh, specific networks that Cray has. So we've, we've been leveraging commodity for about 20 years. I'll argue that cloud and big data centers have benefited greatly from the legwork we've done in high performance computing. Again, as an entrepreneur running around Silicon Valley, I've spent a lot of time at the big data centers, and you, you understand the lineage of many of their tools goes back to some of the tools that the labs have done worldwide in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. The one thing that I have a hard time getting across to students today is that work in high-performance computing really does give you a background that's unique. Way back in the, in the day, the Cray system would do two reads and a write per clock. Everybody who did HPC stuff would count the number of bytes on the wire and the number of clocks on the CPU. I guarantee you somebody with that background is not gonna build Hadoop. The, the, the distance between highly efficient and very focused on how things work and a let's just throw as much hardware as we can afford at it to get the, the solution as fast as we can. There's a huge gap there. And when I go and talk to the Yahoo's and, and Amazon's and, and Google's and so on, the engineers generally don't get that. It's a gross simplification, of course, but the engineers there generally don't get it. When I meet someone with an HPC background, it's really surprising how much value they have. I've literally seen mid-level engineers be poached for millions of dollars out of the labs to go work in these environments because of that background that they can bring to them. With the end of Moore's Law and Denard scaling, HPC is going to be continuing driving innovation here. The labs can reach around in their pocket and find 10 or $50 million to impact something significant. And with the combination of the IP that ARM is bringing to the table, we have some really interesting opportunities. So I want to talk about the business model a little bit. As I said, I'm new to ARM. ARM's business model, specifically with respect to high-performance computing, is that we license IP to silicon partners. 
In the US, Marvell and the Thunder X2 is the big deal. In Japan and the recent announcement, the A64FX is the Fujitsu system that was just recently announced. There's Huawei, there's Ampere, there's a number of silicon partners that are building server class architectures based on the ARM IP. Platforms, they, they then sell their chips to the platform providers, the HP, Atos, and Cray, which then provide them downstream to customers. So as an employee of ARM, I'm quite a distance from the actual deployment at the end customer. However, I've worked for many of these end customers as well as the platform providers. A little bit of a gap in my career with respect to silicon providers, but I can relate to these folks. And where ARM really hits the road here is in the software ecosystem. From my perspective, the whole magic of ARM's IP and server is the fact that ARM then comes in with a software stack, not fully developed by ARM, developed by the community, ARM develops the compilers and the profile toolers, tools, that sort of thing, and provides that to the silicon provider. So why would a Fujitsu, for example, choose an ARM ISA for their next HPC system? Well, because there's a semi-mature software stack for them when they get there. That's a really, really important piece of this. I've been asked why ARM versus RISC, for example, and I think that the RISC folks are gonna have a problem with the software stack. Um, a specific nit on this is at, in Japan, Satoshi Matsuoka is the director of the Rikken Computer Center who's getting this 150,000 socket system. He'll stand up and tell you that due to the ARM ISA and the server ready program, which is the test suite that, that ARM provides, Red Hat Linux booted first try on that silicon and he said that Windows would boot on that silicon. I don't know you want to run Windows Server at 150,000 sockets, but because of the a tight adherence to standards, the rest of the stack works on top of that. And I think if, you know, if I were to go work in the risk environment, that would be the area that I think I'd be able to add the most um, value is, is trying to keep that going. So this is the business model. What's resulted out of it um, is a new entry into the top 500 called Vanguard. This is a machine at Sendia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, Mexico. And it is number 200 and something, 203 I think, on the top 500 list. It was the first at scale attempt for an ARM based system. I'm, as a little side, I, I get a real kick out of people saying this is an ARM system. It's really either a Marvell system, Cavium system, or an HPE system, right? But everybody says it's an ARM system. So we get the credit for all the hard work that the partners downstream are doing. I had um, met with the internal software team prior to this machine going in. And given my vast experience in standing up systems, I, I basically said, put on your seatbelts, because when this system hits the floor, nobody's getting sleep for three months while they try to get it up and running. And of course, they told me, you know, we're all optimistic software guys. This is just going to work. No problem at all. And I ended up having to eat my hat, because literally a week later, this was up and running. And when you talk to the applications people, they will tell you it's a compile and run environment. Two or three days, and these really multi-million line of code applications compiled and ran on this system. Then of course you're gonna spend the rest of your life optimizing, so that doesn't really say how fast they ran, they ran, which, which I thought was a, was a huge positive. Most of the labs in the US at least have small systems like this. Every story is the same. The software is such that you can compile and run. Two, three years ago, ARM bought, um, the compiler outfit, I'm blanking on their name, help me John, Alinea, and Alinea Studio and their tool set. That was a software tool set and compiler set that works across platform, Power, x86, and so on. And so for them to just do an LLVM backend on their compiler to ARM was not a heavy lift. And so I attribute the maturity of all this to the fact that they've been doing these same applications for 10 years now. But the 
the nut of this is that these systems are much easier to install today and much more mature when they hit the ground than the systems that I was installing 15 years ago. Closer to home, HPE has donated three high-performance computing systems, one of which is located here in a project called the Catalyst Program. So these three systems started to be installed in November of last year, and they are up in GA available now. So 64 nodes, 4,000 cores, which was the target that I had when I came out of university, was to build the world's fastest machine, 4,000 cores. Here we are dropping them on the floor as a donation to the universities. And thanks to HP and SUSE and Cavium, now Marvell, these systems are being planted around seeding the community for software work. The local, the local system called Fulham is up and running and now is available for access. So if you're an HPC interested person and want to come play with an ARM-based system, here it is for you. We've got publications starting to come out now. And so this is, this is literally up and running both in the UK, there's some Atos systems on the, on the continent, and then of course, all over the US. One of the benefits of the ARM design is efficiency and leading edge nodes, leading edge um, silicon process. And so many of the exascale projects are looking at ARM as the, the base technology that they're using. In China, they've selected ARM in a project with a company called Fidium, the Fujitsu machine. The European Processor Initiative is looking at ARM as a potential core for their, their entrant. And the US has projects that are not yet announced that they're looking at ARM. A critical piece of that is, again, back to the business model. What ARM does is provide the piece in the center, which is the base IP. Nobody should have to go build a multiply add device anymore, right? That's just stuff that's been around for a long time. So ARM will license you that core bit, and then you as the silicon provider can decide how much I.O. to plumb into that, how much memory to plumb into that. This Fujitsu box that I keep talking about literally has no DIMM slots in it. It has four stacks of HBM sitting on top of the chip. So it's only got HBM memory. And that HBM memory runs at a terabyte a second. So imagine a node that's got a five, two by five, 12 vector unit with a terabyte of memory bandwidth. These guys are gonna set some performance records when they come out publicly with what's going on there. So the silicon provider can decide what sort of off chip bandwidth and memory and so on, as well as add whatever unique IP they want here. Fast forward to discussions about chiplets, you can imagine a design that lets you build your own unique accelerator for AI or whatever other workload you have, toss them on the same substrate and mass produce those, which coincidentally um, last uh, AWS reInvent, which I believe is just the first week of December. One of our silicon partners now is Amazon. Amazon took an ARM design, call it Graviton, and you can go, it's the A1 instance when you go to Amazon, you can go rent an image of an ARM design by the hour, the same way you rent Intel designs. Now this is an ARM Cortex design, right? It's, it's the, the traditional architecture, not the server architecture. But early indications are that it's running workloads at par with many of the x86 designs that are there. Clearly not the heavy workloads, but any workload that is uh, I.O. stuck, for example, you're gonna run the same on pretty much all the, the uh, different architectures. And it's at a 45% discount to the end user with respect to pricing. So this is a little bit the thin edge of the wedge of the huge companies saying, we're big enough now that we can do our own silicon design. You might imagine, as I said on the previous slide, some sort of AI image recognition architecture bolted onto the side of this and then made available. 
So that to me is an interesting spot to watch. On the same day though, and back to the HPC idea, Amazon on the same day announced this elastic fabric adapter and it wasn't something that got a whole lot of press, but effectively it's a kernel bypass messaging layer. Right? Who uses that more than anybody else? It's an HPC type feature, right? So Amazon is targeting HPC with, with this image. And if that doesn't convince you, they now support Lustre native and will, will do the support in-house. They've hired some people out of the Lustre community to help them do the storage bit. So Amazon is accumulating all of the pieces to go after the HPC market here with the uh, Graviton with the ARM-based system as well. A little bit tangentially, but alongside of that, with our Neoverse announcement, we had a huge number of logos sign up to be included on the announcement. Now, not many of these are HPC type logos, but the intent here on this slide and the next is to convince you that there's a whole software industry that is working in the cloud on AWS that really wants to have alternative architectures. So part of my statement earlier was your scientific application will land on, on the Catalyst system and compile and run. The same thing is happening in the cloud to where the end user doesn't care what the hardware is. They care what the cost to solution is. And Amazon is busy, as, as they've shown over the past 15 years, dropping the price of the AWS instance. This is a big drop because they've got all the same software and they're using a much cheaper processor. So all of these things come together to let me predict that down the road, the software development environment between an x86 and a non-x86, i.e. ARM, will be at least equivalent, if not balanced, in favor of the ARM architecture. ARM is a first-class citizen for Red Hat, for example. You can buy support from Red Hat. If you're checking code into the kernel and it breaks the ARM build, it's on you as the code contributor to fix that now because it's a, a class one architecture, okay? The HPC software ecosystem, sorry for the bright lights here. Those of you who imbibed too much last night, put on your shades. The software stack, we're, we're leveraging OpenHPC. The software stack looks very familiar to those of you working on HPC. It's not as mature as systems that have been out there for 20 years, but it is rapidly converging on that. There are several paths through here where you choose your your language, your parallelism standard, your debugger, all that, that just works today. And we're working hard with the community to flesh that out and make it generally available. We really believe that HPC is, um, is a leading indicator of where the server class technologies and the cloud class technologies are going. So we work a lot and are working more with, with research institutes and with people in national laboratories to make sure that we understand what they want and try to get them there. We have um, a website if you're interested in taking a look at HPC. There's a, a URL there that you can go find out all the information you want. I won't linger on this too much as I see I'm getting time. The, the architecture or the hierarchy inside ARM is that I run high performance computing. I have a peer in David Lacomber that runs the software group from the compiler and tools and a peer in research, Eric Van Hensbergen, who some of you may know that runs the hardware research. Those two groups have been going on for a while. David's group for a few years, but Eric's group for 10 or more. So they've got deep relationships with the community. They've got centers of excellence, as you can see here, scattered around both Europe and the US and are doing interactions with them. As I come up to speed, I'm incredibly impressed with the topics that I see going on right now. Um, 20 years ago, processor and memory was a hot topic. What I see now is the hardware researchers looking at minimi minimizing data movement by moving, moving uh, 
processing capability out of the center of your CPU towards the cache lines and towards various other pieces of your silicon. John Shelf used to say it was six picojoules to do a flop, but 100 picojoules to move a piece of data across a silicon substrate. Those are the sorts of discussions that I get to listen to. I can't contribute a whole lot because it's not my background, but that's the level of impact that high performance computing is having on server architectures down the road. If you are interested in interacting with folks here, this is the email address that you need to take down. Andrea runs all of these programs here in the UK or in, in Europe. We're very active in the Horizon 2020 projects. Mont Blanc uh, had just ended and now we've got, I guess Mont Blanc 3 just ended and now Mont Blanc 2020 is going on. So we're, we're eager and being as active as we can in these things. Again, I'm a bit new and of course I'm in North America so I'm not entirely intimate with all of the locations here in Europe, but this is my fourth trip here so far this year. I'm not scared to get on a plane and I'm very interested in interactions with folks here because I do believe that researchers could impact the design going down the road and, and would like to encourage that. So this is, is my last slide again to remind you of where we're coming from and where I think we're headed. I get involved in a lot of this across the board and of course I try to hand off relations to the folks at ARM that really know what they're talking about in those other areas, including a lot of HPC with Eric and, uh, and David around. But I'm here to make sure that the right conversations happen and that ARM gets into the room so that down the line there's a Cray-based ARM system that people want to buy or an Atos-based ARM system that people want to buy. Um, so despite having a technical background, uh, my per career progression went from writing compilers to being CEO to now being senior director at ARM, and I'm having a blast. Um, so I'll stop there. If anybody has questions. Let's thank our speaker.